This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining me today with Richard Fields in the middle, John Cameron on the other end. And gentlemen, the world has finally caught up to my inflated ego. It's As we turn look around the world, we've got inflation running rampant everywhere. Germany, China, United States. And it's a... Uh, who do we blame? The Fed is stuck between the rock and a hard place. Do the, you know, lower rates low? Do they stop QE? What do they do? Are they going to stop? What, Richard, do you have any idea what the Fed is actually going to do? Or what, what they will do? Will it even make a damn bit of difference at this point? The Fed doesn't know what they're going to do because they are stuck between a rock and a hard place. If they uh, do a Volcker, if they uh, decide we have erred in our ways and we have... Uh, been uh, 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 helping out, aiding and abetting the inflationary environment that we're in now by the massive increase in monetary supply over the last really 20 years, but they've doubled it in the last in the last couple of years. If they if they you know acknowledge that and start to reverse that by ending quantitative easing. Now, just so people know, quantitative easing is just a polite word for inventing new money. You know, printing it out. Or, you know creating it at the touch of a computer uh, button and lending it to essentially the finance, to Wall Street, to uh, money center banks. Basically, it goes into it goes directly to Wall Street to be used by speculators. That's that's how they create money. So if they do that, if they cut back on the money supply, uh, stop quantitative easing, raise interest rates, do the things that Volcker did back in the 70s uh, and 80s, if they do that, the stock market will crash because the only thing and the bond market, the only thing that's keeping bonds and stocks and for that matter, real estate levitated like it is, is all of the liquidity. Liquidity, again, just a polite, a polite way for talking about money, newly created money sloshing around the economy looking for a home. Where's the home? Well, since it's going to people that already have money, they're not spending it on uh, on cars and trucks and uh uh, you know, toilet paper, uh, you know, or they haven't been up until recently, they're spending it on assets. Now you've got the increased money supply combined over the last couple of years with Congress giving money directly through st stimulus payments directly to small business and to uh, individuals through enhanced uh, unemployment compensation, the STEMI payments, et cetera, et cetera, to do with, uh, with, the, with the coronavirus crisis. So what you've done there is you've pushed money directly into the consumer economy. That money, uh, some of it's going into stocks, witness the uh, people buying uh, stock in game shop and other crazy uh, stock ideas. But part of it is going into stuff. That's why the price of bread is going up. The price of meat is really going up. The price of eggs is going up. The price of gasoline is going up. We're seeing inflation in actual consumer goods. When inflation is limited to assets, people who have assets are happy. People who don't think, well, everything must be okay because the uh, stock market is doing well, even though I'm not in it or I'm in it in only a minor way, can't be bad if stock prices are, are going up. Uh, ignoring the fact that they're getting 0% essentially a return on their uh, savings accounts. They can't, you know, saving money is a, is, a, is a fool's errand because you can't make any money on your savings. So we have, a, we have a, a situation where the Fed, if they take away the punch bowl, the stock market and bond market crashes, if they don't, we have more inflation or continuing consumer inflation, because there's only so much that can go into asset markets before it starts spilling over into consumer goods markets. And that's what has been happening over the last over the last few months. Yeah, I, I um, <clears throat> God, I, a lot of these shows lately, I've started everything I say with I agree with Richard, that's going to stop. Uh, can't have that. The the um, I don't know we're not we're not in the business of giving advice but um, people who are looking for something to do based upon either one of the scenarios um, you know well one of the scenarios is is inflation staying the way it is because the the Fed decides that it it can't uh, raise interest rates and 
crash, you know, real estate prices, bond prices and stock prices. You know, and the other one is that that, uh, as Richard said, that, you know, you do put on the brakes of the money printing machine, you know, the uh, virtual money printing machine and uh, those things drop. So, you know, and investors, uh, I don't know, unless you're you're, you know, buying puts and calls, uh, you know, to cover your stock portfolio, um, you know, what do you do? You know, if you short stuff that, the, you know, there's time you got to cover short interest. Uh, years, years ago, Richard and I talked uh, about uh, something to do when there was another bubble in house prices. And, um, and it was the right thing to do. But we couldn't we couldn't convince other people who had say into the end of the decision to, to do what we wanted to do, which was, you know, sell the house at the top of the bubble and then buy it back. <laughs> A few years later. Uh, so, I mean, there's, you know, if you don't know what a government, if you're basing your investment decisions on what a bunch of, in essence, bankers are going to do to support other bankers, because these people, you know, weave in and out of the banking industry and the Fed and back to the banking industry and the Fed, then, then I'd say that's that's a, another reason for there just to be a whole lot less government. I mean, that's the lesson. I mean, because, uh, you know, you look at every decision you make for investment now, you have to make it, make it based upon what is some government regulator going to do? What is the gover government going to do? What is the tax structure going to look like? Uh, more importantly than what are my competitors going to do or how good is my product or service? And and that's just a terrible thing. You know, we, we used to have, uh, you know, basically three kinds of risk, you know, business risk and market now, I mean, more risk than that. But now the biggest risk is what the powers that we let be decide. You know, if they smoke a lot of dope, they might do one thing. If they have a little too much whiskey, they might do another. Um, but what, what's concerning to me is, you know, the talk about who to, who to be in the Fed. And, you know, they're talking about the... Um, you know, some of the some of the candidates that that might be, uh, you know, in the Fed and and they're all rah-rah about one of them, at least the regressives are what other people call progressives, because they're more interested in transforming the economy. And I'm 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 a little I'm a little worried about somebody being, you know, cheer cheer led because of that. one of them by the name of Sarah Bloom Raskin thinks the Fed should get into the uh, Mitigating climate change business. Now, what the uh, what the Fed can do to mitigate climate change is beyond me, but uh, I mean, she probably has some bright ideas. And if I had any bright ideas, I certainly wouldn't share them because she'd probably try to use them. Uh, you know, but don't we blame the, the liberal fem, Fed members? Uh, no, they're, they're all except one members of the Federal Board of Reserve are nominally Republicans. Mm -hmm. Jerome Powell's a Republican. Mm -hmm. All the rest of them, except for one, are uh, appointed by and are Republican in, uh, you know, rhino at least, or Republican mm -hmm. in name only, but certainly not Democrats, not liberal Democrats, mm -hmm. just one. So you can't blame, it's not a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a Wall Street against Main Street issue. And mm -hmm. that's what it has been for a very long time. That's a, what it will be, continue to be until until this bubble, and that's what it's turning out to be. I mean, I have a prediction to make. The Fed will say, when, whenever the stock market starts, the Fed will you know, talk a good game about uh, lowering inflation, but as soon as the stock market and the bond market, particularly the junk bar bond market, start to crash and a bunch of uh, corporations go bankrupt because they can't refinance their uh, zombie loans, when that happens, the Fed will, will cry uncle. They'll say, okay, that we tried that, didn't work. The money gates are open again. Go out, spend money on assets, have fun, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what I predict will eventually happen, mm -hmm. and that, of course, will lead to runaway inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's who who knows whether that whether I'm right or not. But that seems to be like a whole lot more liable to happen since the people who, the, as you put it, the powers that we let be, since they own most of the assets, those are the people that have control over the financial system over the political system they're going to say don't ox uh, don't bore our ox uh, you know go after somebody else our ox is the uh, is, is the asset markets don't harm us uh harm somebody else and somebody else is uh, you know it's the the working stuff who has to pay for pay th through for all this stuff through the increase the increased price of uh cracker jacks mm -hmm. 
And I think you made that a point on your Substack article, I think, this week, Richard, if I remember correctly. You can go to, you can look up Richard at some Substack, or you can go to libertariancounterpoint.com and find the link to the article there. But I think you made that, is that the essential point you made? Well, yeah, I mean, that point is that this has been going on for a lot longer than prior to the, or than the pandemic. I mean, the money supply has doubled since the pandemic started, roughly. But back in fall of 2019, September of 2019, some funny stuff started happening in the uh, the overnight lending market. The overnight lending market is where money center banks, Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of America, Chase, and so on, Deutsche Bank, where banks like that. Now, we're talking about investment banks, not commercial banks. We're talking about banks that make most of their profit, profits in the trading uh, on the trading desk, whether they're trading derivatives or trading stocks and bonds or what have you, those are those are our inst are are, uh, are uh, the investment banks. And those banks, when they have a, a cash shortfall to meet their obligations, they get to go into the overnight lending market. And the overnight lending market, where banks borrow from each other overnight, crashed. It became totally illiquid. And, you, you know, normally the overnight lending market, it's, you know, a half a percent or something like that to lend on an annualized basis to, to borrow money overnight. Money could not be had at any cost. The Fed saw that happening and said, oh, oh we got a problem. We have a uh, we have a, uh, a, a crisis sneaking up on us. So they introduced massive liquidity into the market, something like, uh, I don't know, I think I figured it out, $13,500 per person on a, on a, for every man, woman, and child is the amount of new money in the fourth quarter of 2019 before Corona uh, that the Fed injected into the markets to bail out, primarily Goldman Sachs, Chase, uh, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, Citibank, and Nomura. Those were the primary recipients. But the Fed, because they didn't have to, they weren't required by law to say who the recipients were of all of that money, they didn't. But they were required to report that uh, who, who who got all that money uh, as of December 31st of last year, and they did on December 30th. They quietly leaked or, or you know, issued a press release, disclosed who those banks were, the ones I just mentioned. Those were the ones that got the lion's share uh, of all of that uh, funny money. And uh, lo and behold, you haven't heard it before, uh, more more than likely, because it has not been reported by. CNBC. It has not been reported by the Wall Street Journal. It has not been reported by, uh, you know, Fox Business. None of the mainstream business channels or any, certainly not the mainstream media, have said that uh, $13,500 for every man, woman, and child was spent by the Fed to bail out the same banks that they bailed out back in 2008, 2009. That mm -hmm. is a scandal that has not been reported. Why hasn't it been reported? Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, Wall Street on uh, Wall Street on Parade reported it, and uh, the uh, Agora Publishing Companies uh, reported it. Basically, uh, since they picked it up from Wall Street on on, on Parade, and uh, Wall Street on Parade is a leftist uh, or center left organization that that uh, tries to do the you know cover the financial markets from a from a, from a uh, small investor perspective. They reported it. And they went out and they asked why, they went to the reporters that covered 2008, 2009 uh, breakdown. And they asked these reporters, why are you guys not covering this? We gave you the story before we broke it. Why are you not covering it? And their answer was interesting. Their answer was not because, not, well, most of them didn't answer it. But the ones that did is, that their answer was not because we're not interested. It's because we can't report it. So they were being told in, you know, intuitively, or the infer the inference is that they were being told by somebody, you can't report this story, or some kind of bad things are going to happen, mm -hmm. and uh, and the story has not been reported. So mm -hmm. you heard it here first. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, we know that the media spikes stories all the time. You know, for whatever reason, whether it's nefarious reasons or they just think that their audience will find it boring and so they don't want to cover it. Whatever the reason. Well, yeah, is. but this is a story that the the uh, that would be scandalous to say the least if it were being reported and, well at least yeah we have we have fox business news channels right we have bit news channels that are supposed to be just cover business right yeah, and they're they're not, not covering it and they don't cover right or left and fox is right uh cnbc is left wall street is somewhere in the middle or wall street journal none of them are covering it and you gotta you gotta wonder 
why is this story being spiked? Because it's the same banks, it's the same as Matt Taibbi called it, the call the Goldman Sachs, the uh, called Goldman Sachs the vampire squid of banking. Same ones, same uh, Deutsche Bank, this you know the ones that gave uh, Donald Trump all of his uh, uh, so, you know questionable loans. These are the banks that uh, got us in trouble in 2008, 2009. Same story, bailed out once again. COVID is not the reason because this happened before COVID. Uh, something's funny. Go something funny is going on, and uh, and uh, the uh, the powers that, as John puts it, we let be are not letting this story out. Who mm. knows why? I'll let you guess. I'd like to. Well, anyway, James is running the show, but I would like to talk about it's a, it's a matter of timing with the powers that we let be and their lapdogs, uh, if if I may. Um, no, happy sir. We've got we've got a few minutes. We got time. We have time today, there, John. We got yep. time. So, so we're one of one of the stories we're 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 looking at is um, a change in the tune of the uh, I I call it uh, nationalist propaganda media or or NPR is definitely national propaganda radio. Um, what what we've what they focused on completely has been one little tiny subset of public health, which is this coronavirus and the ill effects of it. And and people on this show right now and other right thinking, not right leaning, but right thinking people have been Correct talking thinking. about people hmm? are doing. Correct That's thinking. That? Correct. Correct thinking. Correct thinking people. Logically, <laughs> logical thinking. Logically. <laughs> have been talking about uh, what people who are experts in public health, Nobel laureate experts in public health, uh, Harvard leaders, Oxford leaders, Stanford leaders in public health have been talking about from the very beginning that, that the, the pandemic is a disease uh, that strikes the old and not the young, uh, and uh, that the, the fallout from the, the panic-demic, that I like to call it, the way the government responded to the pandemic has created all of these things. Now, the left-leaning media like Wired and New York Times and all the rest of it, they're not going to say, they're not going to use those words. But now, recently, New York Times published an article that spelled out the fact that a 70-year-old male, because uh, women don't don't get as sick from from the COVID that as men do, according to all the numbers that are out there, a 70-year-old male uh, who's been vaccinated and boosted uh, is more at risk of dying from influenza than from uh, COVID. And then they talked about the fact that children are very, very unlikely to get sick and much less unlikely to die. They didn't do the numbers. But then they started talking about all the ill effects on on uh, you know, the kids not being able to learn and the closed down businesses and all the rest of that. So we were talking about this two years ago, right when this thing started. We we're talking about you know deal with it as if it's a public health issue, put it in the box and don't have it crush the economy and schools and lives and and force a hundred million people across the planet into the worst form, probably two hundred million now of poverty where they're living on less than a dollar a day. So my question is not whether uh, the people on the propaganda boards, I mean, the editorial boards of, of uh, the left-wing stooges like Wired and the New York Times have suddenly discovered two years late what we knew all along, or whether this timing is completely political in nature. They've looked out, they've taken the pulse of America and decided that um, based upon the the seething anger of the American public about all this stuff that's going on and the, the, the logical nonsense of it, that they, they, they better start letting the public know that they're leading the way and just discovered all this stuff and, oh, my gosh, here's the solution, so that by the, term the, mid, by the time the midterms come along, um, you know, Biden and his cronies and all the rest of them won't be the ones who are the oppressors, but the ones who are opening things up because they've looked at the data and discovered that this is the truth. So here's How my convenient. Are you saying, wait, are you saying to yourself, tell us, John, that primary season coming up is having a, is having something to do with these political, these non-political health decisions that are being made all of a sudden? 
Mm. Yeah, that's, 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 that's my question to you. Do you think it's because these, these uh, people who are actually quite intelligent, <clears throat> most of them are sociopaths, but they're quite intelligent, uh, have finally figured out what we figured out about three weeks into this pandemic, uh, panic demic, as I like to call it, or do you think they, there is an underlying political motive to them uh, um, supporting the position that public health experts uh, pushed for right from the beginning? Which, which I, one? I think it's all just a coinkadink. Do you think it's a coincidence? Coinkadink. Coinkadink. Coinkadink, yeah. And Richard, accidentally on purpose is what I think it's all been done accidentally on purpose. We printed, I mean, we've talked about inflation. We printed all kinds of money and then we, we restricted economic activity. And then we're surprised that eventually the, you know, those bills are going to come due. I think right now the, the, the politicians are figuring out that fear of inflation is gaining ground and in some cases surpassing fear of dying from like from COVID. Hmm. And once that is a majority position, which it will be eventually, uh, then they'll say, oh, uh, we need to change our uh, policy and we'll change it in the direction that we libertarians have been advocating uh, since day one. Uh, I mean, if you take a look at the, uh, the case numbers and the uh, death numbers uh, based on the newest, oh my God, variant, or I'm sorry, Omicron variant of, of the virus, Case numbers are through the roof. They're way higher than they were at this time last year. But the death numbers are a fraction of what they were last year. So we have obviously uh, got a, uh, a version of the virus, which is a lot less, um, how can I say it, a lot less uh, lethal than the, uh, the earlier versions of the virus. And don't get us wrong, the virus, the early versions in particular, uh, were devastating, particularly for people who were obese or had other comorbidities. We've always said that. And those kinds of people always should have been protected. But most people, including the, the most people in the, in the working uh, field, working uh, in the workforce, and most people in education, particularly students, uh, have not got a whole lot of risk. The risk of the 19... Uh, what was it, 1998, I forget, the 1968, the 1968 Hong Kong flu had a higher death rate than the uh, the worst of the COVID. We didn't shut down the economy for the 1968 Hong Kong flu, nor we, nor should we have. And and uh, it's it's time we reject the cult of fascism, mm. named yeah. after yeah. Dr. Anthony. Well, and, and yeah, I, I absolutely agree that fascism is a wonderful word. I don't know who invented that first, whether it was Reason, reason or uh, uh, National Review or one of the, I saw it first in one of the either libertarian or conservative uh, publications, but it's a wonderful term. Maybe you invented it and they stole it, Richard. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. The I other don't. thing I think that still uh, people are, are acting like it's still news is that um, people are voting, you know, uh, with their feet uh, still in this country, and and I uh, and that's a good thing. And and a a uh, attaboy or rah rah to federalism because people can choose to move from uh, places like where I live, Kafka Ornia, which is beautiful, uh, but um, or California for those people who don't realize that the the state has actually changed its name to Kafka Ornia. Um, and um, to places where they're treated better and capital's moving, you know, to places where it's treated better and labor's moving to where it's treated better. Students are moving, uh, their parents are moving their, their kids across state lines to get better age, education. And, and the fight for, um, you know, the fight for um, uh, freedom of choice in schools. You know, there's a fight for freedom of choice of a different kind in Texas. And, you know, uh, that that's uh, we'll see how that pans out. But freedom of choice in education uh, is driving people to um, to move to states that that uh, don't teach as much propaganda and each and teach little Johnny to you know, read, write and do arithmetic. Uh, and also uh, there there will be a big force over the coming couple of years to give people um, freedom of choice, especially vouchers in well, let's, tax yeah, credits. Well, let's be clear where, where they, they're leaving from. They're leaving California, they're leaving New York, they're leaving Washington, DC, they're leaving Chicago, and they're going to places like Arizona, Florida, Texas, Idaho. And so <laughs> this isn't, 
you know, but the sad part is these are communities and families being ripped apart because of politics, because, you know, interventionist politics where we've got politicians who want to dictate, you know, our lives, the outcomes of our lives. We're having our communities or cultures and our families ripped apart because of it. And it's just sad. And while, you know, yeah, we're speaking with our feet, people are moving when they can, but you know, families and communities are being ripped apart because not because people necessarily want to, but because they're feeling like they have to. Well, and I kind of feel sorry for places like California and, and Texas because people are leaving California because it's become unlivable in many in many neighborhoods. Uh, but they're bringing their crazy ideas, which made California unlivable, with them to uh, places like Austin and Miami Beach. Uh, so it's you know it's uh, they're bringing their politics with them, and that's that's bad news for uh, the places they're going. Yeah. Well, yeah. Speaking about, we got two minutes left, so I'm going to cover this last thing. In California, we've got uh, our schools are changing the formula. And I've got some sympathy for them changing this formula, but I don't trust why they're changing the formula. The, currently, now, if you, you know, kids get, schools get the money based upon how often the kids are in school. So if they miss a day of school, they lose a day of, of, of pay. And now they just want to go based upon pure enrollment. Hmm. And there's... <laughs> There's bad incentives both ways. And so if I trusted them for wanting to do this properly, I said, okay, it's probably not a, such a bad idea, but I don't trust them. All you, need to know, all you need to know, James, is that the uh, uh, bill that would change the uh, change the, the, that situation from enrollment to, or from uh, uh, attendance to enrollment is sponsored or co-sponsored by the California School Employees Association. Now, I don't remember learning in high school civics that uh, a public school union could be a co-sponsor of a bill in the legislature. I thought you had to actually be uh, an assemblyman or a state senator to be mm -hmm. a co-sponsor. But mm -hmm. the news story says it's being co-sponsored by a labor union. That's mm -hmm. all you need to know. And here's here's my quick 30 cents on it. The, it, it it's black and white here. And, and what they're going to do is uh, change the law to where they get paid on enrollment and then make sure they never show up in the classroom and kids never show up and they still get paid. And um, so it's, it's that simple. Except really. Pollyanna, John. Yeah. Well, I have some sympathy because, you know, as someone who went through school with an anxiety disorder and I literally graduated school with less than a 50% attendance rate, I have some sympathy to this notion that, you know, attendance and tying pay to attendance is, it, you know, there's a problem with that. But there's also a problem with, you know, the attendance and this idea that, well, we're just going to make sure this kid's cousin sits in class, whether they learn anything or not, whether it's the proper environment for them or not. We're just going to make sure they go there and sit there. We're going to use guys with guns to enforce yeah, it. I mean, the, the, the underlying problem is that the, the, the they take money from taxpayers, they shuttle it up to Sacramento, and then they shuttle it back to individual school districts. It should go directly from parents to the school. That's what private schooling and what uh, homeschooling and what... Uh, uh, vouchers are all about. Keep the funding source close to the uh, place where they spend the money. Take out the middleman. And with that, we are out of time. Thank you guys for watching. I want to thank you guys for joining me and we can find us next week. And please remember to love everybody.